Well, are you um have you been enjoying our little discussion here about uh, pronunciations of of names? <laughs> <laughs> we all have the same problems. <laughs> so would you would you would you um um how would you pronounce um Ilermina's uh, name? <laughs> I usually say Gisha, but that sounds yeah. wrong. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people call me Gisha. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay, so, right. So um should we kick off? Um should we um um just before we go, um I think what might be really useful is to um just um to inform everyone we will be uh translating this uh talk uh today and it would be really useful um if you on your zoom uh bar that there's a uh, on on there's a bar maybe most likely on, or at the bottom of your screen, there's a, a button called interpretation. And if you go into, um, if you go into interpretation uh, it's, uh, and then you select either English or Spanish uh, channels, there are two channels, uh, then you'll be able to either hear uh, the, um, the talk translated into Spanish simultaneously um, or it can be in the English channel, but please do try to select one or the other, uh, unless you are a bilingual speaker, you know, then uh, I'm, I'm told by Yasmina, who will be kindly interpreting today. Uh, she said that uh, people who speak um, either Spanish or English can, uh, don't have to choose either of the channels. That's, I was told. Um, um, would you like to say that in Ushla in Spanish uh, for the Spanish speaking people so they know um, what to I do? suppose, I suppose, uh, yeah, 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 Jasmine uh, did. <laughs> Pero okay, <bueno>. let's, <laughs> let's, uh, let's suppose that. Okay. <laughs> Pero bueno, eh, para los hispanoparlantes, eh, si quieren, pueden elegir el, el idioma eh, me, haciendo clic en el icono de interpretación que está en la parte baja de su barra. Eh, ahí están los tres can dos canales de español e inglés y eh, si no lo cliquean, lo dejan así, van a poder escuchar ambos. Gracias. Ok. All right. Um, hello, everyone. And um, ah, Liv, you you're going to kick off, yes? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, welcome, everybody, to this event, uh, Engage with Ideas, arranged by the Design Literacy International Network. Uh, my name is Liv Meret Nielsen from Oslo Metropolitan University. Uh, today we have invited Guillermina Noel to present her ideas. Was it right, Guillermina? Okay, Perfect. yeah. <laughs> A warm welcome to you. And we're very much looking forward to hear your presentation titled Health Design, the New Design Literacies. Mm -hmm. Just shortly about the network. Uh, the Design Literacy Network builds upon the idea that design is not a matter for professional designers alone. In order to move in direction of a greener and better tomorrow, designers and the general public in their position as politicians, consumers, users and clients need to be involved, skilled and critical in order to accomplish real cooperation. This is of increased importance for democratic participation, diversity and equity in society. And we are also building upon the ideas of the Brazilian educator Paulo Freires and his writing from the 1970s, but we have added design to his concept of literacy. Uh, through this series, Engage with Ideas, it's our hope to open up for different perspectives on design literacy, both for the education of professional designers and the general public, and of course, for their practice. So please, Eric, would you introduce Guillermina? Um, yes, um, Guillermina uh, Noel, um, we've invited her um, uh, to discuss her 
um, paper titled uh, Health and Design, Mapping Current Situation, Envisaging Next Steps. And um, it's, a, it's a base for today's talk. And um, she'll be, um, I'm pretty sure, covering other you know, areas of her research that she has done in the area of health and looking at the you know, designer's involvement um, and what sort of skills they need to have. Yelmina is a, um, a head of um, a bachelor a degree in management, innovation management uh, at Lucerne University of Technology in Switzerland. And um, she has been very active in the area of design management and, and she has been very active in, in, in writing and um, uh, uh, arranging a, um, a special issues uh, that she has um, recently done. I think it was with uh, Shiji. Is mm -hmm. it correct? If yeah. I remember correctly, and it was a special issue that was, you know, looking at an areas of, you know, future of, of design um, and, and uh, management. So what I'll what I'll do, um, if the, if I have left anything else, Yermina, please do, you know, um, edit in. But I would like to, you know, um, for you to start. But before we go, I just would like to say a few things. Um, one, we we try to have. Um, these talks as much as discussions rather than um, and that's therefore what we do we would kindly ah. you to ask if you have a questions do put them in a chat uh, that you have a question and we'll dedicate quite a substantial amount of time for discussions you know after we have the presentation um, and and it's about you know building on the knowledge of already published papers that we're trying to do with these talks Yermina, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. I would like to start by thanking you. Thank you, Ursula, Liv, and Eric. Uh, we have a couple of conversations previously. Um, it's very nice, this opportunity that you are giving me of, to review a paper that I wrote five years ago. So um, it was nice, the process of rereading, and I said, what was I trying to do here? <laughs> and what are the things that I agree with Five years later, I think that uh, I have changed um, the understanding of things, like my understanding of human center design, for example, have changed. And I have also changed what are the competencies uh, that I think are necessary today. I tried to put the link of Sheishi, uh, but for some reason, I don't find a way to send it to everyone. Uh, I have the name of a lot of people. What, I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll pop it in. So everyone in I'll, meeting. I'll find it and I'll do it. Okay. Everyone in okay. meeting. There you go. So that's go. one of the um, uh, issues, which is also related to the history of how I wrote this paper. Um, before starting to share screen, I give you a little of background. Um, when I wrote this paper, I was right. I was working in the Faculty of Medicine um, at the University of Alberta in Canada. So I was um, working in a very different context and observing a lot and comparing a lot the teaching of medicine and the teaching of design. And I was having a lot of difficulties um, in finding designers. I needed to to expand my team finding designers that could work with me. So that was a little bit um, that um, triggered this reflection of what, what were the skills needed in this area? Uh, what were my expectations? Where were I, I, I was seeing the commonalities between design and healthcare or, or medicine? Um, and this thinking that I was going through um, also to explain what, what was I doing and why I was, the way I was working um, was a context in which I wrote this paper. Sometimes um, I have a lot of frustration because there were people that have um, done training in design thinking, healthcare providers or, or administrators, um, and have done training in design thinking, in the design thinking understood as in five days. Um, we have a workshop, we have a lot of post-its, we do uh, fun activities, whatever fun means, and in five days, we will solve complex healthcare issues. So working with people that have that kind of training created more barriers for collaborations. 
um, than synergies. And so um, there, there was a process of unlearning in that person that needed to happen in order to be able to work with me. And that caused frustrations in, in both parts. So now I think I can share screen. Um, if you have questions about my background, we can talk about that later. I will go first to desktop. Um, I see that I don't have. Do you see my screen? Yes. And do you yes. see um, yeah. the sign mapping current situations or you see the Shashi article? No, 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 the, the presentation. Good. So this is basically the structure. I will try to talk for 20 minutes. Um, in the paper, I outline what are the new challenges and the new challenges is to uh, help healthcare providers to provide care that fits people's life. And what are the new opportunities? I will talk very briefly about the commonalities between human-centered designs and or synergies between human-centered design and evidence-based care and patient-centered care. And what are the new skills are necessary that we need to work on that? And I will do a conclusion. Before that, a key quote for me so that we are all more or less on the same page um, is this quote from the Institute of Medicine, it's an old quote, um, that healthcare is not just another service industry. It is fundamental nature is characterized by people taking care of other people in times of needs and stress. Um, at that point, I think that uh, Harvey Feinberg, who is a person that I admire a lot, was the president of the Institute of Medicine. And, and for me, that was key that for me, design is also taking care of people in times of need and stress. Um, so I, I could already see how we, we both have a common goal. Design for me is about caring and we can talk about that um, later. So in the paper, I make four claims at the beginning. Uh, the first one is that designers that work for health, for the health field are not often educated to perform a systemic approach to the task and respond to the demands in an uninformed ways uh, that are not accountable and do not lead to significant quality improvement. I saw a lot of that. Um, and unfortunately it uh, plays against design because then after they don't, uh, um, healthcare systems or healthcare providers don't see the value of what we do. Particularly we believe with that in, we can do it in five days. Um, also the designs are not implemented. That happens a lot because they were not done properly. Um, and if they are, the performance is frequently not measured. So nobody knows the efficacy or what changed with that design. Um, See, the design shop is frequently done by design students or research graduates, um, because those who commission the project believe that design is only to give a professional look at things. Uh, that has changed today, but at the time that was the situation. And many times design products, particularly visual presentation of information are conceived and crafted without even consulting the designer. So, a lot of um, project managers will have to do something and they will do it um, with their best of intentions, but perhaps not even aware that is something called document design. So that was the, the four claims I did. And so the new challenges were evidence-based medicine, which is an approach to treat patients in which patients' view and preferences um, are considered together with um, the medical expertise and together with the uh, um, latest quality evidence. And people-centered care, which is trying to put the person that have, is receiving the care at the center. So I have a couple of uh, quotes here. So it, it, evidence-based medicine aims to produce and deliver high quality and relevant research to healthcare providers and patients to ensure the safest and best possible care. The ultimate goal is to change practice and improve quality. Now, I would like to make a parenthesis because in design, there, there are a lot of things going on in design today. Among them, some people are 
against the idea of evidence-based design. So how I understand evidence-based practice is through this article that I recommend people to read by Denise Rousseau. Um, and, and she explains evidence-based practice is a discipline approach to decision-making and action, the hallmark of which is attention to evidence quality and the use of the best available evidence. Its goals are to improve the results of professional decisions and to increase the use of practices that lead to desired outcome while eliminating dysfunctional practices. All professions engaged in, in evidence-based practice make use of scientific evidence and methodologies, reflecting the premise that science can improve outcomes through a better understanding of the world. Um, she also makes the point that that requires always local knowledge. So not just at looking what is published, um, but also what, what is the case in the situation that we are addressing. So the, the uniqueness of the situation we are trying to address. So this is how I um, understand evidence-based and how and why I advocate for it. Now, evidence-based medicine, Patricia Greenhalm is, is the leader in this area. Um, and she said, the problem is how to make this evidence easily available to healthcare professionals and patients, or is, this is something that I say, not her, and how to transfer this into clinical practice. Um, something that she says in, in a paper that talk about um, evidence-based movement, uh, a, a movement in crisis, is that an audit done of a 24 hours medical take in an acute care hospital identify 3,679 3, pages of national guidance, an estimated of 122 hours of reading relevant to their care. So the problem right now with evidence-based medicine, one of the many problems is that there are too much going on. So in Canada, you might have the guidelines coming from the province, the guidelines coming from the federal government, the guidelines coming from a um, group of physicians, uh, the guidelines coming from the US, the guidelines coming from uh, England, guidelines published by um, a group of physicians that specialize in a disease. So the amount of evidence that they need to read makes their practice very difficult. That's one of the things um, that I noticed at that point. Now, human-centered design, at that point, my understanding of human-centered design was mainly focused on uh, people's needs and preferences. I was intentionally avoiding to use the word wants, and I still do. Uh, so people's needs and preferences um, when performing daily activities. Now I have change it um, and perhaps expand it more than change it. And I understand um, human-centered design as an approach that enhances the well-being of communities and our environment. Human-centered design studies the complexity of people in their context and engages with them in activities to envision better ways of living. So it's not just about designing product and it's not about making products easy to use. That's how I see it. Human-centered design starts by recognizing that one does not know about a particular problem. That's how I start most projects. For example, while a designer might know about planning a co-design session, she or he might not know how it is to live with a chronic disease like diabetes. Hence, learning is required. And that learning, for me, requires research. And that's the local knowledge that Denise uh, Rousseau was referring to. Human-centered design starts also by recognizing that we have a bias. We are always operated as observers, so that in fact, what we explain is our experience. And particularly for designers, that is a challenge. And that comes from a book of Humberto Maturana, who is a Chilean, um, Chileno, and uh, Ferdinand Seller. And human-centered design involves embracing diversity Within this frame of understanding, human-centered design goes beyond ease of use, as I said before, and places well-being as a main purpose. Uh, there are a lot of discussions today about um, decentralizing design and why focus only on human. 
I don't think that we can separate humans from the environment. I, I, for me, it's quite obvious that we cannot live without an envir environment. In this case, we have a planet. Um, and sometimes some people use the term humanity, um, and, and it's a good term because it refers to us community. I, in the case of healthcare, human and the singular is very important because the way each person live or experience uh, a disease is unique. So I see value in, in the singular. So patient-centered care. Um, the workers' organization has recently issued a call to implement people-centered strategies to health services, and that was in 2015, so at that point was recent. Healthcare practitioners need to support patients to set goals to improve their health, manage their disease, address barriers, and create plans to achieve goals. And this is in the context of using evidence, plus combining with the needs uh, and, and preferences of, of each patient. So this paper of Glass New and Highness is very much contested in healthcare. But, and, and I, we can talk about later why. Um, and, and the main reason why is that because they take a mechanical approach about how um, knowledge is transferred in healthcare. But for me, there, there was a value in the paper and, and there still is. And they said that to move from evidence into action, there are seven steps. The one is to be aware that there is evidence. Second is to accept the evidence. Uh, we saw that with COVID. The third one is to apply it. The fourth is to implement it. The fifth is to act on it or upon it, to agree to use it, and to adhere to. That's more the point of the patient. So this is very interesting. So they said that 80% of transfer at each of these seven stages results in only 21% of this evidence getting into the patient or patient use, the adhering part. So um, for the government of Canada, this is key because uh, the government of Canada invests tons of money in research in healthcare to provide better care to the citizens um, or the community. However, 21% gets to the patient. And that is where I see the gap for the designers and the value of the designer. So from the design of guidelines to make the evidence accessible and persuasive, to the design of training materials and decision aid to facilitate shared decision making, human-centered design can help in implementation process in these seven steps. And I think can help more, but at, at that point, that is um, where I, I saw the opportunity. There are many areas in which, in which design can contribute. I work more in shared decision making because it's part of um, a knowledge translation and in implementation. And, and I am um, very much interested in implementation sciences. So human-centered design and patient-centered care, um, these require health providers and patients' constructive engagement to collab collaboratively plan care paths. And that's a process. And that is a process that requires a lot of adapting and a lot of getting to know each other. Hmm? Once you have a, a disease in your life, a diagnosis and a disease, that requires already adaptation from, from the person to accept that is sick and to learn to live with that condition, particularly if we are talking about chronic disease. So human-centered design and patient-centered care, human-centered design can help health professionals not only understand what it's like to live with a chronic condition, a terminal disease or a disability, but also to situate people in their social, economic and cultural context to uncover health barriers and facilitators. There is a physician that I admire, his name is Victor Montori, and he works with an excellent designer called Ian Hargraves. I think that there are a very strong couple uh, working in, in healthcare design. Um, and Montori talks about patient capacity. So one, once I have the treatment, it is very important for the healthcare providers to understand if the patient has the capacity to implement, to take that treatment into their life. And most of the time, they might not. So the, again, that need of adapting the treatment to better fit the uh, per person's life is, um, 
is necessary and design can help there. I don't know if it makes sense to go through this. So in the article, there is an image, uh, a table in a way that you can look at. And I outline uh, eight different stage, stages where design uh, can contribute. Um, and I was making like a scenario. So the first, first one was uh, identification of health relevant knowledge gaps. And so what is the current reality? My grant application to co-create personalized care plans was rejected. The reviewers are lab centered, not patient centered. That's something that I hear a lot um, when I was in the faculty of medicine. So design uh, sciences can help researchers, health professionals, patients, and family to identify what is needed, what is best for patients, their families, providers, and society. But what is needed for that to happen is to achieve people-centered care and reviewers need to be familiar with the value of design. And unfortunately, they are not. So I will not go through all of these um, uh, seven evidence stage acting. So these, these seven stages are the one I presented from the article um, of Wagner and, uh, or no, uh, um, I don't remember their names. We can go back and review their names. So what is the current reality? Oh my, I need to remember to use this tool. I have enough things in my head already. Many times with the best of intention, the healthcare system will design a tool, but they did not design in taking into consideration how physicians are working or how clinicians are working. So for that person to incorporate a new tool in, in their life or the, in their working uh, routine, is an effort and they might not do it. Most likely they might not do it. So design can help creating strategies that remind and nudge professionals to incorporate the new practice. Um, and what is needed, leaders need to identify barriers and nudge provider to act on evidence. So when you design a tool, you need to understand that you are asking people not only to use the tool, but to change the way they work. And that is a behavior change and that is not something that is straightforward to do. So it's not about visuals. Um, eight, shared decision-making. The current reality at that time was, I want to talk with my doctor about treatment options, but we didn't have time. Unfortunately, that is very frequently the time and, and not only in, in Canada. And design can uh, help designing and evaluating decision L, aids to support, kind and effective conversations and arrive at shared decision-making. What is needed for that? Leaders need to make um, every possible effort to support patient-centered care. So something that was very important for me was uh, the work of Ronald Heifes, who um, he's a physician, but he created uh, one of the first program in leadership at the Kennedy School, Harvard Kennedy School. And he, outline three types of situations. And I saw that for, at that point, for design are very important. Type one is I can solve uh, applying technical knowledge. So if, with my knowledge of typography, with my knowledge of layout, I can solve this problem. Type two, learning is necessary. This situation requires adaptive change and the responsibility for success is shared. Um, type three, the problem is unclear. So we don't even know what is the problem that we need to work on. And learning is mandatory. And um, adaptive work is necessary. People need to change their ways of doing. And that was the example I was talking before. Many times I believe that the problem is to do a tool and that's seldom the problem. So there is a need to really understand what's going on. And my perception at that time was that many designers were not ready to try to understand what's going on, very easily they will say, yes, I will design a tool. So they will be working on a type three problem as if it were a type one. So situation that cannot be approached by knowledge of typography were being approached. So at that point, I said that design education has in the main been project and craft based and design strategies were normally addressed with insufficient knowledge of the areas that could provide evidence. And I was quoted Donna Norman saying, my experience um, with some of the world's best design schools in Europe, United States, and Asia indicate that the students are not well prepared in the behavioral sciences. 
I wrote to Don at that point, um, and that's part of how uh, I wrote to Don and Jorge Fracara and um, Ken Friedman, to the three of them, and that was the beginning of the two CC special issues of design education. We can talk more about that. And today, um, Don has created together with Meredith Davis and Karel Frenderburg from IBM Design, um, the Future of Design Education Initiative. So I will look into that um, because both Don and myself have changed how we understand the situation of design education. And that's something is very difficult to read. Don't, don't read it. But these were parallels that in this exercise of reviewing the paper five years uh, uh, later, seven years later, um, I started looking at what have changed. And, and I think this was interesting because the weak parts of the article for me are in the design competences that were needed. The way I see it today when I reread it is that the skills at that point were basically at the research level. Today, I see other skills that are needed um, to work in healthcare. One is learning to learn and be aware that um, we have to be constantly learning. Um, ask questions, being aware of language, and that's something that comes from Umberto Maturana. Um, and he, there is a conversation of Maturana and from Foxters, um, um, and they are talking about cybernetics. And Maturana says how language already can limit it, your research question. So if I said consciousness is, I am already implying that consciousness is, rather than saying, what are the things that can help me demonstrate that there is consciousness? So language affects a lot the questions we ask, and hence how we look at problems, and hence what we find out. And so I think that it's essential, relevant, uh, need to have emphasis on language. Uh, and Gregory Bason is another person that makes that emphasis too. Uh, challenge the assumed problems and help reframe it from diverse human perspective. Listen with care and with all senses. Today we are pretty much aware that we don't only have five senses. And listening is very difficult, particularly when you have your biases in the head, making noise and selecting information as you listen. So I think that that requires a very different type of listening, more profound if you want, uh, or diverse. You need to listen with your eyes and you need to listen with your whole body and you need to listen with movement if you want. Um, to look at human situations, sensing the diverse perspective, needs, worries, and we can go on. Um, perspective, preferences, uh, that list can be really long. To understand that we live in conversation, and that's something that I, also something that I have learned from Umberto Maturana, that we live in conversations because we are um, language mammals, as he put it. Uh, so you need to sense that conversation. I have done a lot of observations and, and physicians um, and patients or other healthcare providers and patients, and you need to sense, and that is linked to the idea of listening with all the senses. Um, but you also need to facilitate conversations. Um, you need to understand that we live, I'm sorry, uh, um, you need to be humble about what is understood because you might not be understanding correctly or you might be understanding from your perspective, as, as I mentioned before, um, how you perceive things and what you believe you know. Be aware about how language enhances or constrains our understanding of situations and operate in healthcare system contexts, cultures and situations, which are very particular and they are not like other organizations in my view. Um, I would not call them industry. Um, I would call them, yes, a service, but not just a service. So I think that healthcare contexts are very unique. So this is 
something that I have changed in, from the time I wrote the paper to now. And conclusion, and that was the conclusion of the paper. I don't know how I would conclude today. We can explore that. While current design programs produce graduates that can work as junior professionals in traditional areas, most graduates are not normally ready for caring and accountable practice. The demands of health design require an education not usually available. I would agree with that today. We have a responsibility to make sure that we create the necessary learning opportunities to educate professionals that have the knowledge and skills needed to confront current health issues. I agree with that too. And I can stop here and thank you for listening. And I hope I am more or less on time. Thank you so much. It was, um, I have lots of questions myself, but um, um, I'll, I'll leave them um, aside. Um, <laughs> If anybody would like to ask a question, uh, Yelmina, if not, then um, you know, I'll take the, the first step. But um, um, anyone would like to come forward? I think I'll, Carl I'll... has a question. So, who? Who's this? Carl? Yeah, okay. Carl has a question. All right, Carl, would you like to come in? <laughs> Carl? No? Did you, Carol, you're, you're muted, you. Carol. You're muted. Yeah, not, not at yeah. the moment, but it's an absolutely fascinating story. It's very recognizable, unfortunately. And uh, I, I can't see countries like the Netherlands and Belgium developing any course in this area mm -hmm. um, because of the restrictions universities have to work with. Um, links with the healthcare is, is hellishly difficult. And um, I'm, I'm very negative about that in, uh, in the Netherlands and Belgium. I'm more positive in Switzerland. Um, I can't see it happening in the UK mm -hmm. at all. Um, so we really need to find very new ways of educating uh, professionals in this area. Because I don't think the university structures are suitable for it. Could, can I ask you, Carol, if you would you mind just to um, elaborate a little bit on what, what is what is the kind of the problem um, in the area in, in Netherlands and and and, and Belgium especially? Um, it is of course two, two, the two tier system. The first one is the, the art and design education on the post on the um, polytechnic level. Uh, it, it's still there. They're called new universities, but uh, they're still not treated as full scale universities. And the traditional universities, uh, University of, uh, universities of Technology, have dug themselves in so deeply into the ethical committees and ethical approvals that design and certainly iterative design processes, where you basically do not know what the next step is, cannot be approved by ethical committees. So it nearly is impossible to do any study that is worthwhile in healthcare because we don't know what the next step is. So we have to approve, get ethical approval again for the next step, which takes another six months. Mm -hmm. And in my practice, I design in the morning, I test in the afternoon. And I design in the morning and test in the afternoon again. And that's impossible in a university. And please tell me that I'm wrong. Which university deals with that? You know, Mina, would you would you like to maybe comment on yeah, this? Yeah, I it's, agree it's with really, Karen. really interesting, uh, you know, area. Yeah. Uh, Karen and myself know it for many years. <laughs> we, we are now collaborating, so I I agree with Karen completely. I also think that um, you need to be in in the context of a hospital, and that was one of my challenges when doing my PhD. I needed to do my PhD in a hospital. Um, and that's the reason why I did it in, in Italy at, at the UAF Institute of Architecture at the time, because it was a, one of the few schools that have at the point a master in medical um, design, uh, it, it closed. It was a master, but they, they just, they, we were like, it was okay to have a PhD. They have PhD, they accepted six PhD per, per year um, candidates. I needed a hospital, not the school. And, and we are unfortunately in contexts that are not medical contexts. And to really, and that's the reason why I said at the beginning, I, I was learning a lot from this uh, medical education, right? Medical education happens in a hospital. 
and in the community. We are in classrooms. And so if, if you really want to train people to work in healthcare, you need a program that will work in a hospital. And, and you need a structure that will allow for long-term projects. If I work with um, prescription of antibiotics, um, appropriate use of antibiotics for urinary tract infections in the emergency department, um, that will be a project that, yeah, I can do something in, in one year, but really to see the results, it takes two to three. So in uh, design education, how do, how do we do that? When is that the students will learn about the impact of their um, strategy on the reduction or, or um, have something changed? Are antibiotic better used now in, in that emergency department? Um, so we don't have the context for, to provide education that I think is necessary. There are labs, uh, there are more and more health design labs in, in universities. Um, maybe that, that will be the first step. I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure about that. All right. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult issue. Um, um, Liv, do you have a question? You're muted, Liv. You're mute. Um, and not not uh, more than a, this is very interesting. And health is really not uh, my my uh, field of of research, but I think it opens up for questions about the cooperation between the. Uh, uh, that all has to do with the care, uh, who is going to be cared for and who is going to care. So this, to have the language as you talked about, but also to know about design uh, issues in order to have this conversation, the dialogue on what is needed for, if it is the aging uh, population or, uh, other kind of diseases, so so um, it opens up for many, very many questions. But but as I say, health is not my field of research, but very interesting, Glenmina. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, my question uh, would be then, um, and it's about um, the relationship. What because what you kind of writing about. Is is um, very much so social science, or you know, it's it's that sort of area, and and lots of design courses do, you know, tend to kind of tackle social issues. Uh, you know, it's a it's you look at the websites and projects they have, and you know, it's it's quite uh, you know, um, it's quite common to do this, right? The however, if you look at maybe the structures of those programs there's very very little of social science being in those programs and my issue is i don't I, i'm not you know i'm not suggesting that the designers what they produce are not effective they're actually very effective you, we, we look at you know how people get it you know addicted let's say to you know social media and so on so they are actually what they're producing is very good in terms of you know for usage purposes but the consequences that come out of it are not the consequences necessary they envisaged the, the designers who produce this so my question to you Ilmina is is about you know how do you square you know how do you square and this is something you know I'm touching on Carl about the ethics but these are different ethical issues these are ethical issues how do we embed those into education and if you look at the scope of medicine, if you, if you want to be GP, many countries you have to, you know, you don't become GP, you know, for 10 years. You know, it, it takes a mm -hmm. long time for you to become GP. In some countries, you can become designer in two years because you mm -hmm. kind of study nonstop. So they packing, you know, a four year degree into a three year degree now. Mm -hmm. Right. So so we have uh, this these issues about, you know. And you kind of touched it about the you know, requirements of knowledge and so on. But you know, how do you square designers being able to operate or to be, you know, also the about the ethics? And it's a lot, you know, lots of on the shoulders to, to have uh, in terms of pecking into the educational system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So a couple of things. One is I understand, um, so I studied design or I decided to continue study design because I read the book of Jorge Fracara when I was in my first year of university. And Jorge understands design very much uh, as uh, related to the social sciences. He wrote a, an, an article many years ago called Design, Fine Arts of Social Science. Then he organized um, uh, a conference that resulted in a book. And I think that Carol, you were in that conference. Um, uh, uh, Jorge, you can write in the name of the book and the link to the book and the articles. Um, so I, I see design very much operated within the social sciences. That's my understanding of design to start with. Something that I think is very important for students and for instructors is that we are not anthropologists, we are not sociologists, we are not psychologists, but you need to learn how to work with them. Frequently, frequently, part of the research would have been already done um, by an anthropologist or by a behavioral psychologist. And then we start, and then we have to see, okay, um, is this information um, enough for me to take action and to understand the problem, or am I missing something? What is that I need to do? Um, there, there are sometimes um, difficulties in, in, in designers and in social scientists understanding ways that what are our commonalities and what are, what are the things that we do differently. For Jorge, for example, one of the things that he will say we do differently uh, for Jorge Flascara is that we take action that we, we move into action, not just into observing what's going on, but into how can we make this situation better. I think that the social sciences are, are also changing. I think that um, design is not the only this discipline that is evolving. Um, anthropology is also evolving, social um, sociology is also evolving. Carla wrote something and I will uh, look at, into that. So we need to constantly learn how to work with other disciplines that are also evolving. And they are also starting to take action and see, okay, um, without being territorial and say, this is, this, is the, this is the part I do. I am the only one that can do this in uh, co-design. Uh, anthropologists cannot do a co-design, so no. So the, we, we need to understand that too. And at the same time, I think that we have unique things to add that are difficult to articulate. How to incorporate social sciences in the program? I think that um, when you have, for example, and, and suppose you have a behavior change. So the thing that is key is for both the students and the, the administrator of the program and the instructors of the program to understand that that gives you an idea of behavior change. It does not make you an expert in behavior change. And you will have to go and work with the expert in behavior change. It will give you an idea of things to look for. So what are the elements of behavior? Uh, how do I start looking at behavior? Do I look at beliefs? Do I look at attitudes? What are the things that I look at? But I'm not a, a behavioral scientist. So if I, I need to collaborate with them. Th thank you so much. Um, I think the Madalena, um, you had a question, if you, if you don't mind. And then we have a, from Carlo, uh, or is it Carla? Sorry, Carla. Um, Carla. There is a comment. Yeah. So we can we can then go to 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 Carla then after Madalena. All right. Yes, my, my, my topic is more or less the same of Carla because of my experience. Uh, I think that we have more problem in the design team than in the medical field. Because in the last year, I believe that medical, um, everything is um, connected with hospital, all skills of the students are more and more connected with the feeling of passions. They are improving themselves in this sense. But mm -hmm. uh, in my experience in Italy, there is not so much respect uh, for uh, what other kind of skills can help us to do. Um, this, the same as I uh, was talking about Guillermina, because I, I, 
I need the, the, the point of view of other kind of uh, experts. But we believe that our priorities, medical matters are more important than design experts and that are more important. And, and if you talk about, with other people, everyone believes that, that his point of view is more important. And the point of view of designer, I think is more open because our mind is open to collect all this kind of uh, point of view to, to manage something that is bigger. Mm -hmm. but, but people don't believe this kind of approach. And this is probably our fault also. I, I'm really interested in how to uh, help uh, students uh, to improve this capacity, to talk with people and to be open to uh, uh, a new way of viewing things. But my question is more economical. Now in Europe, we are all, every, all of us are involved in the PNRR, the, the, the new balance of Europe. We are sharing money in Europe to finance, to found uh, um, some particular topics. Health is one of the main topics together with uh, energy and so on. So in the last few months, all countries in Europe are designing new projects, uh, trying to spend this money. And uh, my view is a bit worrying because in Italy, we are mm, believing that we have to open new hospital, uh, that we have to do a lot of things, but without taking time to think if this is the the right approach, because we don't believe, uh, we don't think about uh, what fashion needs, what people needs, uh, but we have the solution. We need an hospital. Probably the hospital is not the solution. So I, I wrote a, a really small project that, that I hope to, it could be financed, I hope so. But I, I, I spent three months in the project to think about. I, 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 I took a step and people said, oh, okay, we can leave it three months, but we can start. No, because probably that your idea of solution is not the solution. And we don't want to spend money and to spend time to think about the solution. But now we have a lot, really a lot of money to spend in the health sector. And I'm a bit worried that without this kind of skills, Guillermina is explaining to us, uh, we can spend money in a way that is not exactly proper. Um, Magdalena, you, you brought a very important point that is applying for grants in healthcare. Yes, you need to work together with a healthcare team, not just with a designer. You will never get the grant if you apply on your own. But also when, and as, as I said in one of the slides, when apply with a healthcare team, you need to be aware that you are competing. For example, suppose you are talking about um, appropriate use of antibiotics uh, for urinary tract infections in emergency care, right? So that's a context. You are competing with STEM research. So STEM research is here and you are there. So chances are you will not get the grant even if you work with a very good team of healthcare providers. So this is very difficult because unfortunately there is a, you compete with uh, what is innovation or what uh, unfortunately patient center care is not considered innovation, which it is, right? Depending on, so innovation, if it, if it is understood as technology, then no patient center care is not understood as technology. So uh, it's difficult to apply for grants, very difficult. That's one thing. Um, the other thing I think that um, is the situation is not just in Italy, it's, it's um, in everywhere. There are groups that are um, well informed. Uh, when, when I was doing my PhD in Italy, uh, together with Jorge Fracara, we co contributed to a team that created slow medicine. And they are also part of Choosing Wisely uh, Italy. And they are part of the um, La Asociazione per la Qualità nella Salute. Um, so there, there are groups with whom you can approach. 
and, and they are very much aware of, of uh, the need is not one more hospital. Unfortunately, many times, um, and that's come from my design management perspective, uh, they believe that the solution is always more, more hospitals, um, more, more nurses, uh, more physicians, um, when ironically it's the opposite. I mean, if healthcare will be successful the, the moment that hospitals are empty, that's when healthcare would really work because we will not have people that are sick. So the moment we have empty hospitals, we will be successful. You talk about solution and some, that's something that I have also changed or, or I'm in, in the process of changing, becoming aware that um, we need to move away from problem solution that dualism that we have in, in design, because I don't think that help us. And particularly many times, the type of problems that we are dealing with are not solved. Um, if we are lucky, they are reduced, but not solved. So the, the, the word, as I said, language is very important. And the word solution, I think, plays against us, because it makes us believe that we have solved something, but we have not we have perhaps uh, found an approach to deal with it in these circumstances, but not a problem. I don't know if I answer um, yes. that to Adomanda. Thank you so much. It's Colonel Priya, you've made a, um, um, a comment uh, in the chat, which is great. Uh, would you like to say something about it? And then we have uh, Jorge Fascara. He's got a hands up. Yeah, hello, thank you. Um, so uh, I just um, told Eric that um, my bachelor's in my bachelor's degree, I, uh, I used to have subjects like psychology, consumer behavior, and ergonomics. Basically, uh, like you mentioned in the paper, that uh, designers who uh, should be open to learning um, and you know think of it as an interdisciplinary approach. So they are open to learning new things and um, look beyond uh, their own field of um, degree they got or something. So uh, in my, um, I'm from India and design is not still, you know, uh, at a very great height in India. But uh, my university, I would say, tried to approach this uh, interdisciplinary approach. Uh, and they, the owner, the, the, the head, the people who have made the curriculum, they also included people from Netherlands, from TU Delft. So mm -hmm. they had this kind of approach and they always made us uh, realize that you have to be open to learning and not saying that, okay, I'm a graphic designer. So why do I have to deal with um, uh, this healthcare thing and go to a hospital and learn these new things? So I think one of the ways is we got a lot of different kind of projects in different domains, which actually, I mean, it was very frustrating for students in the beginning to say, oh, why, why should I do this? It's not my field. But I think it was a very good attempt for the university to do this. So we are open to things and not shy away from learning more. Because it's, I think, for, as a designer, you can never stop learning because every time you have a different problem and you have to face it in different ways and learn, always learn new things. So I think it, it is a very important uh, discussion in the design field that you have uh, brought and like university should try and implement these things. Yeah, thank, thank you, you. For, for sharing your, your idea. I do believe that uh, having real projects in design education are key. Unfortunately, the time that we have in the term is very little. Uh, seldom in, in the bachelor, particularly in Europe, that are three years, you have the time to really go through a whole project. And that is, I see as a barrier. But working with real projects in real um hospital for context, that is, is, is very good. Thank you for sharing that, your experience. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And yeah, I believe it is um, like you get project for a four months and it's not uh, easy for you to go in depth and actually, you know, make that, make it that impactful. So mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I had a four years degree, but the end was just 
project for and a dissertation <laughs> again it was divided in few months so yeah i think it's just in your during the education time you are just you know touched upon things and you have to explore yourself so that is something maybe the university should encourage if they're not able to implement it by themselves yeah it's a it's thank you so much kind of priya for sharing um that with us Jorge, Jorge Fascara, you had a, your hands up uh, very patiently. Yes, uh, like yes. I, I just want to rescue uh, the one thing that I think is the most important central thing of Gija's presentation, and I think she might agree to that, uh, that uh, there are two kinds of things, knowledge of design and caring. One has to do with knowledge, the other has to do with an attitude. When you care, then uh, you can solve many things. You just get to learn what you don't know. And when you find a physician that also cares, then the relation is extraordinary. I have experienced that several times. Uh, Umberto Maturana comes again. He talks, uh, I don't know if it was him or Francisco Varela. Structural coupling. That is the secret of success of species and environments, of partners in a job, and I think that um, uh, Guillermina mentioned Victor Montori and Ian Hargraves have that structural coupling. One is a physician, the other is a designer, and the, the partnership is fantastic. So what I think is that one of the things we have to look for as practitioners of design is smell the environment. Where is there a physician who cares? If you find that, you will be able to form a good team. Uh, would you agree, Guille? Yes, some, the, the notion of caring is, is an interesting one. I will say that most healthcare providers, not just physicians, um, they care. Sometimes the working environment is so overwhelming that the capacity for care gets affected. So we really need to understand that it is a very difficult environment to work with. Um, so same physicians don't have time or, or the nurse was running is not understanding really how they work because it's a very difficult environment to work with and I think that um, caring requires capacity so I might be a caring person but the environment where I am working needs to um, foster that caring because otherwise my capacity to care gets affected Thank you so, so much. Um, uh, we, it's the last questions we have from Pilar. Uh, yeah. Pilar, would you like to come in and then then we'll um, wrap up uh, today's session. I think it was, you know, we, we potentially could be going on, but I think it's um, time to wrap it up. Um, so Pilar, would you like to come in? And you are, I think you're muted, Pilar. No. Pilar, you want to write a question in the chat? Sí. Perfecto. Gracias. Nada que. Pilar, eh, a ver, trata de preguntar de nuevo. Parece que me escuchas. Pilar. All right, I, th I think we might have lost her, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. Which is, uh, but is there Jorge? He, Jorge he Yeah. Um, we'll, why don't we finish with you? Ah, Pilar is back, but. Um, I can be. Se escucha? Ahí yeah, se sí, se escucha. Lo saco la imagen. Bueno, mira, muy corto. Yo realicé hace más de 30 años mi proyecto de título para los diabéticos infantiles. 
y trabajé con animación y video. Y ese proyecto me llevó a hacer un, una especialización en cine animado en Italia. Y lo maravilloso de ese proyecto es que yo logré sacarlo a través de los laboratorios. Es decir, uh -huh. logré eh, que se pudiera implementar a través de trabajar con los laboratorios, y en este caso era el laboratorio Berger Mannheim. Entonces siento que efectivamente hay una posibilidad enorme en mejorar la salud, pero no tan solo en esta dupla eh, médico-paciente, ¿cierto?, y hospital, sino que también hay terceros, como en este caso los medicamentos y eh, una serie de otras instituciones que están buscando el aporte para generar el bienestar en todos. Este proyecto de los diabéticos infantiles fue maravilloso porque logró generar un espacio donde la insulina era el superhéroe de insulina, ¿cierto? Era una animación que a los niños también le hacía entender de una manera mucho más simple todo el proceso que tenían que llevar. Entonces, si eso se logró hace treinta y tantos años, yo me imagino que hoy día los laboratorios están mucho más preparados para aceptar y trabajar en este desarrollo de productos que efectivamente lleven su marca. Eh, pero en una búsqueda de un bienestar humano general. Así que eso es lo que me fascinó escucharte, muchas gracias, y, y sentir que bueno, desde estos países, ¿cierto? Junto con Maturana, como lo nombraste, ¿cierto? Que también lo hemos desarrollado harto. Y Pablo Freire, en esta alfabetización uh -huh. del diseño, eh, tenemos muchas que, cosas que decir y seguir compartiendo de estas latitudes eh, uh -huh. en idiomas también distintos y en contextos, como muy bien tú planteaste, tan diferentes. Así uh -huh. que eso, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Pilar. I, 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 I agree with, is, is it okay if I answer Ursula, do I answer in English or in Spanish? As you want, because we have uh, just me, so. Okay. So I, I agree with you, Pilar, that there are um, many other contexts, um, not, not just the hospital. I don't un understand the context of healthcare just the hospital. Uh, actually, today we know that healthcare starts in the community. If we have healthy people, then they don't need to go to the hospital. Um, the, the person that perhaps should uh, answer more about working with labs is Karen van der Barde, who works with patient information and he has done uh, a lot of videos and a lot of um, information and projects on um, information for patients. So he is more the person that should talk about that collaboration with uh, pharmaceutical organizations. And, and also with the patient information um, agency, Carol, I, I don't know if then after you want to talk about um, that. It's a very different topic. It is, uh, <laughs> but it, it is what, what I miss is, is uh, support from design education. I can talk about um, information for patients and, and start from the patient's perspective by interviewing patients in their kitchen table and interviewing patients in, in hospitals and in pharmacies and so on, that that's fine. But the, the, the fundamental problem is that it's always on my own. It's with a small group of people. And if I approach a design school or a design institute to support me in whatever, making medicine boxes or making insulin pens or making redesigning pharmacies or pharmacy systems, uh, It, it takes 30 years to get get used to these to study the context to have a clue what's happening and i can tell students what to do and they get their results come out quite amazing and are in conflict with everything we do within a four week pra practical project but that doesn't help us further we know what's wrong we don't listen to patients and if we start listening to patients like you say we don't need more hospitals we don't need more doctors we don't need more nurses we don't, don't need more money The money is more than sufficient, but we need to listen to patients. And if you talk about healthcare, let's start putting the patient absolutely central in absolutely everything we do. And we don't. We put money central. And as long as that's happening, it's a fight against, you can design whatever you like. But as long as we don't put patients central, it's, it's not happening. And it starts with the European regulations. The European regulations about medicines have got two starting points. The first point is we need to protect public health. 
that means that medicines need to be safe to sell. Not because patients are in danger, but we shouldn't sell medicines that actually damage patients' health. That needs to be checked. And the second point is um, medicines, uh, sorry, the, none of the regu regulations in Europe should hamper the trade in medicines by the pharmaceutical industry. So the, the rule one is it shouldn't damage pa patients. And rule two is we should make profit in the pharmaceutical industry. The word patient does not appear in the European regulations, not in the American regulations. We need to start from patient's perspective. We need to change the fundamental laws in Europe. Rule number one is put patients first. The European directives, European regulations, the American regulations, Australian, Japanese, Canadian regulations start from public health, not from patient's health. That needs to be changed. And that means the designers need to change and get, get, get the, the arguments and the, the data, the, the, uh, the evidence that the regulations are wrong. And that's fundamental. I'm, I'm sorry, I take over, but that's that's, the question okay. there. that's a that's a that's a big project. That's a, we should go for the funding for that and uh, do a, a really nice project on that, Carl. Um, Jorge Hintek, um, you you wrap up the the question. If you 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 wanting to, I think, ask question. Would you would you mind step in? Oh, the best for last, I guess. Huh? <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, I've been listening to this topic. I'm not coming from, from the medical side, so I don't have much to say on that. But what I see is that uh, we have a, an, an issue of translating this design um, discipline into other contexts. That's the, to me, that, that's what's crystallizing. If you have good uh, synergies between individual people, like uh, Jorge Frascara was saying, then that will work because they have a common interest and a common understanding. But if you want to institutionalize it, like Yermina was arguing in her in her paper, uh, then you don't, right? The, this is very difficult to transfer the stuff that you teach in design school into a medical context. So the question there that was arising for me is, do we need to have like a, a specialization track in design, design for medicine, design for education, design for, you see, where you start understanding not only the design, but also the context uh, of, of what's happening there. I mean, med the, the, the doctors do the same thing. They all come up understanding the skeleton and chemistry. And later on, they, they look at if they specialize in the foot or the nose, right? So um, maybe we can have something like that also in, in design. Design doesn't, the training doesn't stop at the bachelor's or master's degree. It goes on into a, a, a practical, uh, uh, you know, immersion into the context in which you will then find yourself moving forward. And that requires maybe two, three years of doing that. I don't know, yeah. maybe something to think about as a postgraduate type of program or, or requirement. I, I think that there is value in the specialization. Um, there is a risk. I, I think that we need to be aware that um, it's not easy frequently for students to find a job when they graduate. So if, we, if they were to be designers, or their degrees only for healthcare, we might be making their life more difficult because there are going to be very few positions. So it should be a degree that have, I don't know, right now in Switzerland, probably they are looking for 20 designers that have background in healthcare. So that, that will be a lot. So I think that we have that reality and that responsibility too. Um, in medicine, they also have the primary care physician who is a generalist and, and is the person that then after um, refers the patient to the specialist that, that is needed. So it is something to consider. I think that maybe there, there is, if we have the solid basis to make the decision, if we have the evidence to make the decision and say, this will be a good idea, uh, and this will be the... the career path of these students and this is how they are going to find a shop after three years or four years or five years depending on the country then yes but we need to be sure that they are going to be higher that they will find a shop then after and for that i agree with carla carla wrote somewhere we not only need to change um this time we also need to help healthcare providers um understand what we can offer so we need to 
to do a, a, we need to do part of the shop too. Thank you so much. I think this was really fruitful and um, and I think there's a more topics coming out of this and uh, hopefully we'll be able to touch on these again in the futures and it's you know fits very well with the design literacies you know who should be literate in what and how and we I think we touch on all these issues today and you know thank you very much for everybody you know participating in discussion and it was really really interesting to, to, to myself and I've learned a lot through the discussion today myself um i just want to say that for the next month uh so these talks are every first tuesday um and the next month we have a talk um by uh, marine carol um from stanford and um she'll be talking there's a i've put a, a link to it and she'll be talking about um you know very much so kind of like fo nice follow-up on your talk even mina um and it's about you know becoming what what does it mean to become you know uh, be an education education designer so it's kind of like one of those specialists and um, so this will be quite a you know interesting topic again looking at you know um, an area of of you know um, very kind of specific um, you know issue um, so would you like to kick us off uh, Liv? I just want to say thank you to all, all and you have introduced the next um, event, Eric. So thank you to everybody and especially thanks to Guillermina. It was very interesting and very nice and we will follow up. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure. <laughs> Muchas gracias, Guillermina, por haber aceptado nuestra invitación. Esperamos tenerte pronto de nuevo por aquí. Y a ti, Jorge. <laughs> gracias. Muchas gracias. Adiós. Bye bye. Gracias. Bye.